carpenter bees look a lot like bumblebees, except that their abdomen is a very shiny black and bumblebees have the striped uh, abdomen. Bumblebees also nest on the ground while carpenter bees burrow tunnels or galleries into wood. Both are solitary bees, meaning that they live in small family groups of typically one male, one female, and then of course the eggs that they lay. They are, next to honeybees, our best pollinators. With the decline of honeybees, it is absolutely imperative that these bees be understood, respected, appreciated, and even well protected. Without them, we lose our flowers and many of the crops that provide us with vegetables and fruit. Among all the insects, bees have fascinated me since childhood. They look like miniature teddy bears, and even to this day, uh, it is very difficult for me to not reach out and want to touch them. Carpenter bees, though, are the ones that I've loved the most. As solitary animals, they seem to behave much the same way that birds behave, and in fact, much the way that we humans behave, although their life cycle is typically just one single season. Carpenter bees prefer to nest in older, previously made nests, but if necessary, they will build new homes by burrowing a very small tunnel in about two inches into soft wood, then making a very steep uh, right angle about 90 degrees and burrowing in another four to six inches. The female designs her cells or bedrooms for each of the eggs she will lay. Then she goes out gathering nectar and pollen. When she brings back her package, she regurgitates it up and forms it into single little balls, which she lays down and then deposits a single egg on top of each. This done, she plugs up the little bed chamber with a tiny door of wood pulp she's also chewed. While the male is not able to sting at all and is very short-lived, He's still very protective of his home and family and will do amusing acrobatic posturings to anyone who comes too near. And sometimes he even dive bombs into the trespasser, no matter how big that trespasser may be, or hovers directly in the face of that trespasser. While the female carpenter bee has a stinger and can, if necessary, bring pain, she seldom, if ever, even uses it. These bees are pacifists by nature and prefer just to be left alone to live their short lives in peace. After she, the mother, is sure her children are safe and secure with plenty of food and sleeping, the female leaves the nest and dies shortly after. For about seven weeks, the offspring develop, first into larvae, then pupa, and finally adults. After those weeks of growing and maturing, the adult children chew through the doors of their bedrooms. Though they do come out to eat and gather pollen in the last of the summer days, they will remain together inside their gallery home throughout winter, keeping each other warm and feasting on the food stores they were able to gather before summer was done. The next spring, though, they will emerge and begin the dance their own parents did the summer before. I highly suspect that this is a female carpenter bee, and I can be pretty sure this is a female since her face is completely black. Male carpenter bees have white markings on their faces, but the color can vary to yellow in the southwest. Since there appear no obvious marks that indicate anything other than a natural death, I can also surmise that her nest or gallery is nearby, probably in my deck or one previously built, and that there is a nursery intact and waiting for infants to grow. Sometimes several families will live in the same gallery, but each makes its own cell area or wing for its own immediate children. Carpenter bees normally do not cause structural damage unless they are extreme in numbers. Since these are among the top pollinators, many people are now actually building bee houses for these little guys that look very like birdhouses, except that these have rows of holes just slightly less than one half inch in diameter already drilled and accessible to the new tenants. For nearly a century, the flight of bees has perplexed scientists and encouraged many to view the, that ability to fly as a miracle that proved that science had failed. 
In 1934, the French entomologist Agnes Magnan, along with André saint Legu, his assistant, compiled calculations based upon the available mechanics of science technology at that time. Unfortunately, that technology simply could not permit them to see accurately what the bee was really doing, so they erroneously made a verdict that based on the haphazard and wild flapping of these tiny and frail wings, such large bodies uh, could never aerodynamically fly. Using high-speed digital photography to fast freeze, then building a robotic bee wing to duplicate those images, a group of both professors and students at Caltech and the University of Nevada uh, proved an amazing new set of rules to flight. I'm going to quote Dickinson here, and I will put the Earl also available to everyone. We're no longer allowed to use this story about not understanding bee flight as an example of where science has failed because it is just not true. The secret of honeybee flight, the researchers say, is the unconventional combination of short choppy wing strokes, a rapid rotation of the wings as it flops over and reverses direction, and a very fast wing beat frequency. These animals are exploiting some of the most exotic flight mechanisms that are available to insects. Carpenter bees, like many other insects, have compound eyes. These are not little individual eyes, but rather individual cells that give only a tiny part of the complete image. Bees do not see a total image the way we do, but because of all these cells, they are able to see movement nearly 200 times better and faster than we do.